Over on the east side of Fenter was the residential area with about 40 houses, the town bar, and the local woods, which were about 20 square miles in across. Even though I'd grown up my whole life playing in those woods, it was still easy to get lost in them, so my father used to tell me and my friends to never go past the creek that ran through about a mile in. Still, this gave us plenty of space to play in, and we spent many summers building tree forts and playing hide-and-seek amongst the tall trees. One late summer evening, me and my friend Jess were out near the creek seeing how close we could sneak up on the rabbits that inhabited the woods before they'd notice and run away. I'd spent about ten minutes searching for one, and in my eagerness, I'd left Jess behind. She'd stopped to examine some odd-shaped rocks, and being impatient, I'd told her to catch up when she was finished. I was just reaching the hill where the creek bent and curved round to travel off north for another three miles, when I spied one chewing on some leaves near an oak tree. I held my breath, grabbed my jacket to stop it flapping in the breeze, and began slowly inching towards it. I was careful to avoid stepping on any twigs. If one snapped underfoot it was a definite game over, and with the sun going down this would probably be the last chance I got to play before I had to go home for dinner. The rabbit was blissfully unaware of my presence, its brown coat tinged orange by the setting sun, ears flopped down like a hunter's hat. The irony didn't escape me as I crept up on it, silent as the leaves floating in the breeze. I smirked. I was about four meters away from it now and it still hadn't noticed me. Not my best, but not bad. I slowed my pace even more. I didn't want to make a rookie mistake in my excitement and ruin this opportunity. The rabbit finished on its leaf and casually began sniffing the next one before digging in. Two meters away now, the closest I'd ever gotten, I felt my heart beat in my chest, and for a second I was scared the rabbit would hear it thudding against my ribcage and dart off. I shook my head and continued up behind it. It was almost within arm's reach. I couldn't believe it. I stretched out my arm, fingers extended. Wait till Jess heard about this. I'd be the first kid in town to have touched a forest rabbit. My hand was about a foot from brushing its soft pelt now. I could see each individual hair on its back. Thirty centimeters I'd done it. I'd done it! Suddenly an ear-splitting scream pierced the air, shaking the silence of the woods into shock and causing the resting birds to panic and scatter from the trees. I gasped, and quick as a flash, the rabbit was under the bush and gone forever. I cursed aloud and spat, frustration clouding my head. It was a good few seconds before I even stopped to think where the scream had come from. Then, like a falling tree, it hit me. Jess! I sprinted back up the creek as fast as I could. She'd been about two hundred yards back when I'd last seen her, near the old silver birches. It took me about two minutes to reach the spot next to the weird pile of rocks. My brow was covered in sweat, and my hair was messed up where the wind had whipped through it, but all I could think of was finding Jess. Even though I knew the woods were perfectly safe, I cursed myself for having left her alone. I spun around in a circle, scanning for any sign of her, but there was none. Jess! I yelled out, my voice traveling through the woods and echoing off the trees. It was getting darker and tall shadows were being cast all around me like a net. Jess, where are you? Call out to me, Jess. I stood and listened, but there was no reply. I was just about to run further up the creek, where the trail began to see if she had started to make her way home, when I saw it. On the other side of the creek, about fifty yards away, it stood, tall as the lowest branches of the sycamore next to it, about seven foot up. It was covered in black rags, ripped and torn across its thin, wiry body, with a hood pulled tightly around its head, obscuring its features. Two white, pupilless eyes stared at me from the shadowed recess, and I spied the flash of teeth. Long, slender arms with hook-like fingers splaying off of stumped hands almost dragged against the floor by its sides. I suddenly noticed an overpowering smell and wondered how I'd missed it. I'd smelt it before on the farms when the cattle were harvested in the slaughterhouses. It was the smell of death, thick and despairing. I almost choked, but my mouth wouldn't make a sound. I just kept staring at it, petrified, blood running cold through my veins. Even the birds had stopped yelling in protest, and now there was nothing but silence, it and I, locked in a gaze that I would remember to the day I died. I don't know how long I was standing like that. It felt like minutes, but it was probably only a few seconds. Suddenly it shifted its weight and hunched down. 
For a brief second, I thought it was going to start running at me, and I almost threw up, uncontrollable fear racking my body. But then I noticed it had stooped to collect something from the ground. I cried out silently. It was Jess, her limp body looking like a doll compared to its freakishly proportioned frame. Despite being thin and stick-like, it picked her up in one bony hand with ease, fingers clasped around her waist, teeth bared in a crooked, humorless smile. It opened up part of its shoal and pulled her close against its blackened torso. I caught glimpses of a rib cage and rotten flesh. I reached out my arm as if somehow I could pull her back to me, but it was too late. It had turned and started to stride off deeper into the forest. Even if I had known that area of the woods and had the strength to move my legs, I would have never been able to catch up to it, and before I even knew it, it had disappeared from sight, like it had never been there at all. Only the heavy smell of decay was left lingering in the air, the only evidence that I hadn't just imagined the whole thing. I snapped my head round and began to run back towards town. It was a good mile's distance and I'd never run that far before. But that day I ran and ran and didn't stop, jumping over fallen logs and ducking branches. I dared not look back. The darkness was almost complete by the time I burst from the undergrowth and into the town's edge. I sprinted to the bar and threw myself into the door, practically collapsing onto the floor. I don't really remember much after that, but from what I was told later on, it took them about ten minutes to stop me from screaming about a demon I'd seen in the woods and that we had to find Jess. By the time they'd actually gotten the story out of me and organized a search party, two hours had passed. Jess's dad shook me and shouted at me, asked me what happened to his baby girl. I could only stare dumbfounded and mute until my own father dragged him off and told him to get a grip. The sheriff organized the townsfolk into two groups and they each took a section of the woods. I tried to tell them that they all needed to bring their guns, that the thing had to be killed. The thought of going up against such a nightmare unarmed was too much. I begged my father to stay, but he told me to calm down, that I was talking nonsense and was probably just in shock, my mind making up stories to deal with what had happened. He sent me home to rest under the watchful eye of my mother as he led one of the groups into the woods. Three hours passed. I was laying in bed still unable to sleep, huddled in my blankets, paranoid of every shadow and creak, convinced that Eit, the nightmare, was going to come back for me, the only witness to its abomination, when I heard the front door open and the heavy steps of men entering the living room downstairs. I listened as they sat down and began to talk. Damnedest thing I've ever seen in my life, Jerry. I don't know what's out there, but it sure riled up the dogs. That was the sheriff speaking. What was it, a bear, do you think, sheriff? I didn't know the speaker, but he sounded young, maybe one of the farmhands. Maybe. All I know is two of my best tracker hounds caught a scent, started going mad. They tore off into the woods faster than I've ever seen them run, and they didn't come back. Now we're two dogs and a little girl down, Jesus H. Then the voice of my dad, I eased up a little. Knowing he was back in the house made me feel safer. Chris said he found the poor girl's gloves down by the creek, right where my boy said they were playing. The unknown voice came again, obviously Chris. It's true, they were covered in some kind of slime or something. Don't know what, but it smelt god-awful. One of the boys almost upped his liquor. Okay, well, at least we know she was there. I'm not hoping for much, but I'll pray. It's one big forest, and the chances of finding her are mighty slim, the sheriff sighed. I suppose I'd better go tell the family that they should be prepared for the possibility that they will never see Jess again. Fuck. No man should have to outlive his kid. And the not knowing like this. Didn't Travis say he saw something big moving through the forest? Another unknown voice, this one knew. Yeah, he radioed in, said he saw some kind of shit, I don't know, giant moving in the distance, but the man was half pissed, and it's dark as the bottom of a well out there, probably just jumping at shadows. No, most likely a bear or a wolf or something jumped her from behind and dragged her off the sheriff again. My father spoke, voice raised so everyone could hear. Okay, let's all go home. It's been a tough night. We'll search again for her tomorrow. Even if it's only a body we find, it's better than the poor folks not knowing what happened. I want everyone to tell their kids not to go in that forest no more till we know for certain what occurred. Understood? 
There were mumbles of agreement and then solemn goodbyes. The men left and the front door locked shut behind them. My father moved about downstairs for a few minutes before climbing the stairs and going to bed. Before he turned in, he poked his head into my room to check I was okay. I just pretended to be asleep. I had nothing to say. I didn't even know what to tell myself. But one thing I knew for certain, I hadn't been hallucinating. I'd really seen it, and whatever it was, it had Jess. I waited for a half hour after I heard my dad climb into his bed before I sat up and switched my bedside light on. I crept out of my bed and got dressed as quietly as I could. Then I descended the stairs. My father had taught me how to shoot and maintain a gun a few years back. Out here in the country it was important to know. Hunting was a tradition amongst the men, and when I was old enough my father would take me camping in the woods for a weekend of game shooting like his father before him. I knew where my dad kept his forty-four. Magnum and rounds in the garage, and after searching around for a few minutes, I found the key for the lockbox. I opened it up, loaded the pistol, and grabbed a flashlight before leaving the house and locking the door behind me. My breath misted in the air as the unseasonably cold chill hung around me. I looked at the forest, once a place of fun and laughter now dark and sinister in the moonlight, branches stretching and contorting towards the sky like skeletal fingers. That thing had Jess and I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do a damn thing to get her back. After all, it was my fault for leaving her alone out there. I swallowed back the lump in my throat and began tenaciously walking down the road towards the woods. Don't worry, Jess, I thought. I'm coming. As I entered the woods, I immediately began to question my actions. I knew that what I was doing was not smart by any stretch of the imagination, that my foolhardiness could very well get me killed. The thought of bumping into the creature, out here, alone in the dark, was more terrifying than anything I could ever imagine. And knowing that Jess was in that very situation herself was the only thing that drove me on. I trudged on the familiar old trail for about twenty minutes or so until I eventually came to the creek. I had never been here before in the dark, and although everything was where it should be, it looked different. It was as if these were my woods to play in during the day. But now in the dark, it was an alien place. This was its domain. I was a stranger here, unwelcome. This feeling was reinforced by the fact I had no idea what lay beyond the creek, except from what I'd seen in the immediate area from the other side. Carefully I crossed the creek, the water soaking through my boots and dampening my trouser legs. As soon as I stepped out onto the other side, I felt like I was lost. How would I find my way back? Which direction would I go in? I ignored the first question. I had bigger things to worry about at the moment, and decided to head off in the direction I'd last seen the creature going. I started walking, vigilant for any signs of movement or noise. I'd expected there to be animals out this late at night, but eerily it was silent, which made me feel vulnerable. Every footstep sounded like an alarm, telling the creature where I was. I stopped for a moment and looked around with my flashlight. I felt like the darkness was swallowing me, that the thing sat just outside the borders of light, laughing at my efforts to find it. I realized that if there was anything out there, the light would only serve to give away my position, effectively ending any kind of advantage I would have over it. After a pause, I switched off the flashlight and waited for my eyes to adjust. It was difficult at first, but after a few minutes I could make out enough of the forest to start slowly making my way through. It was about ten minutes later when I heard it. A short, sharp yelp to my left in the distance. I paused and waited to see if any other noise was made. A moment later a snap echoed through the darkness and a dull thump. I was not alone anymore. Swallowing fear, I sunk to my haunches and slowly made my way towards the noise. I had plenty of experience at being quiet from the rabbit game, and even in the dark I didn't find it too hard to distribute weight so as to move almost silently. After a while I reached a clearing where the trees parted to a grassy patch about half the size of a football field. In the center of the clearing was a rocky depression that sunk down into the earth. I was about to make my way over and investigate when I saw it. It was standing near the edge of the clearing to the south and was slowly limping its way over to the depression, dragging something behind it. In the dark I couldn't make out what it was, but it was about the size of a child, except if the child had been snapped in the middle. It flapped limply with every bounce like a paper fan. 
I swallowed a lump and tears stung my eyes. I wasn't sure if I was more scared or sad. I prayed to God to not let it be Jess and continued to watch it as it reached the pit and then hurled the object over the rim. It hit the ground with the unmistakable sound of crunching bone. The creature bent down head first as if to crawl down the rocks and then stopped. Slowly it stood back up and sniffed. I instinctively pressed my back to a tree, removing myself from view and strained to listen. I heard it sniff again softly and walk around in what sounded like a small circle and then... nothing. I waited. For what seemed like eternity, I waited. I was unbearably tense, expecting to see its milky eyes slowly peer around the side of the tree, followed by that big crooked smile at any second, or a long hooked finger to slide out of the darkness and rest itself on my shoulder. Nothing happened, though, and nothing continued to happen for the next couple of minutes. Gathering my courage, I hesitantly glanced around the trunk only to see the clearing was empty. I double, triple, and quadruple checked the area, making deadly sure it was gone, and then I stepped out back to the clearing edge, making sure to keep low to the ground. To step out into the clearing was out of the question, suicidal. What if it was only hiding at the clearing edge itself, or waiting in the rocky fissure at the center? It would defy all logic, rebel against every survival instinct, and yet I had to know. I had come here looking for Jess, if I turned back now, without checking to see if it was her, crumpled and contorted at the bottom of those rocks, then I may never know. The sheriff was right. The not knowing was the worst part. Before I stepped out, I pulled the magnum from out of my waistband and cocked the hammer back, being careful to mute the click by smothering it between my legs. When it was loaded and ready to fire, I began to slowly inch my way out of the safety of the tree line and into the open. I took a few steps and stopped, waiting to see if anything came crashing towards me. When nothing did, I continued my cautious journey to the depression. When I reached the lip, I aimed the gun ahead of me and looked over. It was a couple of feet deep, about ten or so, and was a little larger than I had expected. One side of the hole was hollow and extended into the ground as a sort of cave, large enough to drive a car through. At the mouth of the cave was the body slumped over a jagged rock. I glanced around again, making sure I wasn't being snuck up on, then started to lower myself down. I would just need a quick glance to make sure it wasn't, or was, Jess, and then I'd leave, run back to Fenter. I'd wake my dad and the others, lead them here, and we'd kill it, in this cave that was surely its dwelling. It could be in there right now, watching me struggle down the smooth rock. But I reasoned that if it was in the cave, then there was noting I could do about it. I must be crazy. Fear has consumed my brain so completely I must not be able to feel anything anymore, I thought. This was proven wrong when I slipped and fell off the side of the rock, landing awkwardly and sending pain shooting through my ankle. I almost cursed aloud but bit down on my lip and shouted silently in my head. Luckily it wasn't twisted, just achy, and I was able to walk on it without a problem. The last thing I needed now was a broken foot. My thoughts were so preoccupied with the sudden pain that I had forgotten I was now right next to the cadaver. My leg bumped against it, and I spun round gun at the ready, almost firing it off into the rocks. I quickly berated myself for being so trigger-itchy, and then looked down. Relief and repulsion flooded through me. From this close I could see it wasn't Jess, wasn't even human. Instead I realized it was a large dog one of the sheriff's hounds that had gone missing earlier. Its back was snapped in two and folded upon itself, and its snout was crumpled back into its face, turning it into a flat, tooth-filled gap. Blood, fur, bone, and brain were splattered over it, and one eye hung loosely from the socket. The eye was positioned in such a way that it appeared to be staring right at me. I looked away and felt bile rising in my throat. The smell of death and decay was overpowering this close to the cave, and I dreaded to think what other corpses were nestled away inside. I was about to begin scrambling back up the edge of the depression when I heard a sob. I spun round and stared into the darkness of the cave. It sounded faint, as if it had come from quite a way away, echoing through narrow rock passages until eventually finding its way to the surface. It came again. This time it was unmistakable. It was the sound of a child crying. The first thoughts to rush through my head were of joy. 
She was alive. It must be Jess, hidden away deep in this creature's lair. And as soon as the thought had come, I realized, with a fear unlike any I had ever thought possible to feel, that I would have to go into the cave and get her. I didn't have a choice. I just couldn't turn back now. I may as well kill myself with the gun I held in my shaking hand, then live with the guilt. I pulled out the flashlight and, readying the gun, switched it on. The beam stung my eyes for a few seconds as they adjusted to the sudden light, but I could see the cave went on for a few meters before widening into a kind of large, rocky chamber that had passages of varying sizes detouring off further underground. I entered the mouth of the cave and shone the beam over the walls and floor. The beam danced over bones scattered across the ground. It looked as if every type of animal in the forest had eventually wound up in here, torn apart then stripped of flesh. I covered my mouth and nose with the sleeve of my gun hand and continued to walk. There were four passages, and the sobbing appeared to be coming from the one furthest to the left. Thankfully, it was one of the wider ones, and I found I could comfortably walk down and still have enough room to stand up straight. If the creature were to come now from the mouth of the cave, I would be trapped. However, if it was already in the cave, then I was walking straight into its spindly, disproportionate arms. I swallowed hard and continued to walk. After a couple of meters it turned right sharply and opened up into a small version of the chamber I had just come from. I was amazed to find it was full of items. Watches, jewelry, passports, letters, glasses, clothes, books, wallets. It went on as if a museum to sentimentality and trinkets. I picked one of the passports and opened it up. Paul Ashcroft, born 1972, Heronford, Ohio. Another read Richard Blunt, born 1954, Westville, California. I shone the light over the letters, seeing the addresses were to places all over the country. Then it dawned on me. I finally understood. It all made sense. The reason I had never seen this thing in the woods before was because it had only arrived a short time back. It must have traveled from place to place, from forest to national park to desert to mountain, picking people off, taking their effects, then moving on to the next town. It was like a sick scavenger hunt. It was killing people and then keeping their items as souvenirs. Another sob brought me back to reality and I dropped the passport to the ground. I hurriedly walked to the back of the chamber I now called the museum and found another short passage and then a medium-sized cavern. Inside was Jess sitting on the floor and crying. She looked up when my light shone over her and covered her eyes. Please, please let me... She burst out into fresh sobs, tears streaming down her pale cheeks. I stood paralyzed for a second. I was so intent on finding her that now I had, I didn't know quite what to do. I decided I had best let her know it was me before deciding on anything. I shone the light upwards, illuminating my face. Jess stopped sobbing and stared. Jess, I've come to rescue you. We don't have much time. We need to go now before that thing comes back to find me here, I whispered kneeling besides her. She did nothing for a few moments, then threw her arms around me, her body shaking. I thought I was going to die down here. I thought it was going to eat me, like it did the rest. I just... I don't... It's... She trailed off, unable to get her words out through the tears. I squeezed her back for a moment, and then went to lift her. The sound of metal clanging against rock reverberated through the cave. I shone the light down, and my heart sunk. She was chained to a heavy metal ring pin that had been nailed deep into the rocks beside her. I couldn't escape, she sniffed. I tried to pull it out, but it's no use. I stood for a second, defeat washing over me. I could go get help, come back, and... No, she squeaked. Please don't leave me here. Panic spread across her face, and it was all I could do to promise not to leave. I thought for a few moments, and then realizing my only option, I took her chin and looked her in the eye. Jess, I have a gun. I'm going to have to shoot the chain to set you free. It's going to be very loud and the noise will probably attract the thing here. She said nothing, just looked at me. As soon as it's broken, we're going to have to run for the cave entrance and back through the woods. She looked thoughtful for a moment herself, and then took my chin, kissed me, and then nodded. I blushed, sitting below ground in a monster's cave, and I was blushing. I almost laughed. I forced the emotion down and just smiled before taking my gun and aiming it at the chain. Cover your eyes. I'll do it on three, okay? One, two. 
A guttural moan sounded from the mouth of the cave and carried its way to us. I saw the color drain from Jess's face and I knew mine was doing the same. It was back. Without thinking, I pulled the trigger. The gun cracked, deafening in such a small space and the chain shattered. I grabbed Jess before she could react and pulled her up, sprinting towards the museum. As we entered into it, I dived behind a table full of bric-a-brac, pulling her down with me. No sooner had we landed on the floor, I saw the creature enter into the room and scramble over to the passage we had just exited from. As soon as it was gone from sight, I pulled her back up and pushed her towards the passage that led to the cave mouth. She didn't need to be told twice and we ran as fast as our legs could carry us. As the cave mouth came into view, a scream full of horror and anger rang from behind us as it discovered its meal had been stolen. As we got to the cave mouth, I could hear wood splintering and the tinkle of a dozens of tiny objects hitting stone as it tore through the museum after us. I grabbed Jess's foot and hoisted her up till she grabbed the lip of the depression and pulled herself into the clearing. I spun around and saw it exit the passage into the main chamber. Its hood had fallen down and exposed what can only be described as a half-insect, half-human face. I fired a shot off in its direction, and it screeched in agony as the .44 bullet connected with its thigh, knocking it back for a second. I took the distraction and spun around, leaping for the edge of the depression and grabbing a hold. Jess seized me by the collar and helped pull me up just as I felt hooked fingers brush the bottom of my shoe. We started to run across the clearing. The sun was coming up now and the sky was a pinky red, casting a slight glow on everything. We ran and ran and ran and ran. The whole while I could hear it crashing through the trees after us. If I hadn't have hit it in the thigh, I don't think we would have stood a chance outrunning it. But somewhere, some god was watching over us. It was about forty-five minutes before we reached the creek, and by the time we saw the edge of the woods, an hour had passed. I still to this day do not know how we managed to run so fast and far without stopping, but I do remember the adrenaline coursing through me so violently that I shook for hours afterwards. When we reached Venter, I fired the gun off into the air. Within two minutes, dumbstruck townspeople surrounded us, some asking what had happened, others grabbing and hugging Jess, and most just staring blankly. When Jess's father arrived, he broke down and cried, holding his girl to his chest and thanking God and me equally for his daughter's safe return. When my father arrived, he took the gun from me, put his hand on my shoulder, and gave me a look. It was a look that said he didn't care what happened, just that he was glad I was safe. Regardless, we had to explain to the sheriff what had happened. After we both explained our stories, a group was organized and armed, and I was asked to lead my dad, the sheriff, and twenty or so other men to the cave. I was tired and reluctant to go back, but next to my dad I felt safe. After a couple of hours we came across the clearing and found the cave system just as we had described. The museum was empty. The shattered chain was found at the back untouched, and a brief examination of the other caves revealed them to contain skeletons of other people later identified as other missing persons from the towns that backed off of Fenter Woods. A medical check showed they had been dead for days. The woods were searched all day, but nothing was turned up. That night, as I looked out my window before going to sleep, I saw it again, standing at the edge of the woods. It looked at me through my window for a while, and I stared back, like when we had first encountered one another, and then it turned and walked back into the woods. I knew this would be the last time I saw it. It was moving on to another place, away from Fenter, from this area. The woods were searched for another week, but nothing was found. The official report stated people had been kidnapped and killed by a maniac who had escaped into the wilderness before he could be apprehended, although the people of Fenter never questioned our versions of the story. So that is my account. This all happened twelve years ago now, and it is but a distant memory. Jess has just finished university and is going on to become a lawyer for animal rights, and I am working on the family farm after dropping out of college. I tell you this story not to entertain you, but as a warning. Next time you decide to go hiking in the mountains or camping in the woods, it is still out there, and next time it might be your town, A decides to visit. Be safe. It was around lunchtime when Noah and I arrived at the base of the hiking trail. 
He practically ejected himself from the car the moment we were no longer in motion. His enthusiasm was infectious. I retrieved our backpacks from the seat behind me and stepped outside as well. Noah had already run ahead. He was standing among the wildflowers and tall grass, looking back with an expectant grin as if to say, Keep up, nerd. His disheveled mop of bleached curls and oversized t-shirt swayed in the warm, dry breeze. The poor guy was built like a flagpole, but hell if I wasn't into it at the time. I rolled my eyes with an amused sigh and jogged up to him, then tossed him his backpack which he almost fell over trying to catch. The year was 2014. We were fresh out of high school and were now blissfully enjoying the remainder of our summer. The plan was to make our way up to some landmark called Wilhelm Bridge. Noah's parents apparently owned a cabin there that they rarely used, the perfect weekend gateway for a pair of horny teenagers desperate for some privacy. Mainly I was just glad that we could stop hooking up in my dad's car. Certain stains were getting hard to explain away. The day was a scorcher. The woods provided cover from the sun's immediate glare, but there was no escaping the heat itself. It made an otherwise easy trek feel as if we were embarking on a goddamn expedition. Please tell me there's air conditioning up there, or at least a working fan. I complained while wiping streams of sweat from my forehead. Afraid not. Think Pops forgot his leaf blower last time we were there, though, if that helps. Noah answered with that trademark shit-eating grin of his, face glistening with perspiration. Very cute. The path tapered as we reached an impressive arrangement of boulders and rocks, likely the result of a landslide. I slowed my pace in order to retrieve the water bottle from the cluttered bowels of my backpack, which Noah interpreted as his cue to run ahead of me once more. He strolled up to one of the moss-covered slabs and then, for reasons best known to himself, determined that it was his duty to climb it. I shook my head and squeezed the plastic bottle, shooting a refreshing jet of lukewarm water directly into my mouth. God, I wish that were me, Noah teased from the presumed safety of his perch. It won't be if you keep it up. Let's go before I pass out. Just a sec. I had no choice but to continue supervising this eighteen-year-old toddler as he hopped from surface to surface. Eventually, after clearing a rather precarious gap, he latched onto the side of a particularly large boulder and clambered up to its peak. There he triumphantly sat, feet swinging and eyes honed on what must have been an impressive view of the park. You're lucky you're endearing. Noah stuck his tongue out in response after which he went back to admiring the scenery. I conceded and plopped onto a nearby patch of flattened grass. Once seated, I squinted upwards at the looming evergreen, catching glimpses of the sky through its tangled mesh of needles and branches. Instead of taking the time to appreciate the untainted serenity of nature, however, for some reason I decided to broach the one topic that Noah hated discussing. So, when do you think we should tell our folks, you know, about us? Predictably, his mood turned instantly sour. He threw his head back with a groan, clearly annoyed at me for reviving the subject. Come on, man. I'm tired. I'm tired of sneaking around. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of getting slapped away every time I try to hold your hand in public. My mom and pops aren't exactly progressive either, but I'm ready to come out if you are. Yeah, but I'm not ready. I'll literally get disowned if they find out. You know that. So, what? You're fine with pretending like we're not a thing? Like I don't fucking exist? Oh my god. Can you not be a selfish asshole for five fucking seconds? I told you I'm not ready. Noah's uncharacteristic but admittedly deserved outburst echoed across the pine wood forest. We both sat in tense silence for a good while, me with my knees pressed to my chest and him staring at his dangling feet. I chewed on my lips and averted my eyes in an effort to stave off the tears. Feelings of hurt, guilt, and regret came together to form a lump in my throat. I shouldn't have pressed him, I knew that. But at the same time, I was so sick and tired of having to conceal something as obtusely trivial as my own sexual preference, and all for the sake of complying with someone else's outdated ideology. I pried my raw lips, intending to utter an apology when suddenly a third voice chimed in. Don't mean to interrupt, but y'all doing all right over there? I was nearby and heard yelling. Surprised, I spun around and saw our anonymous spectator emerge from the surrounding woods. The first thing that stood out to me about the woman was her excessively long hair. It was white, peppered with the occasional strand of silver, 
and spilled past her knees in thick, heavy clumps. Tangled in it were various twigs, leaves, and God knows what else, making her appear like some sort of ancient woodland spirit. After a rushed and clumsy descent, Noah rejoined me on our side of the clearing. Sorry if we startled you, ma'am. Just had a disagreement is all. He stumbled to explained, face red and burning with embarrassment. The old woman smiled and leaned against her walking stick. If I had to guess, I'd say that she was probably in her late sixties to early seventies, though her unkempt appearance made it difficult to tell for certain. Behind the curtains of hair she wore a faded yellow dress that barely clung to a pair of weak shoulders. It looked to have once had a floral pattern, though it was difficult to tell for certain. It takes a heck of a lot more than that to startle this old hag. Haven't heard your voice before, though. Guessing you ain't locals? No, ma'am, promptly confirmed Noah. Can it with the ma'am thing, boy? I ain't your schoolteacher. Name's Agnes. As the odd woman introduced herself, I noticed that she wasn't looking directly at, but rather past us. It took me a moment, perhaps longer than it should have, to realize that she was visually impaired, if not outright blind. I couldn't help but wonder what someone in her condition was doing out here all alone. My boyfriend nudged me, hinting that it was my turn to say something. Pleasure to meet you, was all that I could think to add. I purposefully omitted the courtesy of revealing our own names. Regardless of how harmless she appeared, I had a gut feeling that there was more to Agnes than what were capable of readily perceiving. Perhaps sensing my distrust, she gave me a nod and made a point of moving the conversation along. Anywho, I'd be careful if I were y'all. The wolves will be out soon. Wolves? Here? I've heard of foxes and coyotes, but never any mentions of wolves, Noah asked with an understandable degree of skepticism. After all, our state certainty isn't known for its native wolf population. You're more likely to get mauled by a bear or get trampled by a deer than you are to encounter one outside of a zoo. Oh, trust me, they're out here all right, and they sure as hell know you're here. My advice is to do what you gotta do and head back. These woods ain't as safe as they used to be. Noah and I looked at each other, mutely concurring that the woman was clearly not all there. The sun was still beating down on us relentlessly, and we were eager to get a move on, so we just thanked Agnes for the warning and continued up the trail. Once there was considerable distance between us and her, I looked over my shoulder and saw glimpses of the crone-like figure disappearing back into the woods. There was no evidence of her ever having been there, apart from the residual feeling of unease in the pit of my stomach. After some more strenuous hiking, we finally arrived beneath Wilhelm's Bridge, which, contrary to my expectations, wasn't an actual bridge, but rather a natural arch between two neighboring cliff sides, effectively forming a sort of gateway. The lodge was a stone's throw away from it, situated near the center of another larger clearing. It was quite the picturesque little property, straight out of a brochure or a lifestyle magazine. I've always been more of a city dweller myself, but even I wasn't immune to its rural charm. We shared a cold shower together and spent the rest of the afternoon indoors. As the day progressed, the torrid temperatures dropped to mostly manageable levels. We decided to have a stroll around the homestead before packaging up and heading back. It turns out that sightseeing is significantly more enjoyable when you aren't on the verge of heat stroke. Who knew? We watched the once oppressive sun now dip behind the hills, dyeing the sky in a palette of reds and oranges, which gradually gave way to an encroaching tide of grayish blue. Holy shit! Noah exclaimed. At first I thought that he was enthralled by the view, until I looked over and saw him veer off in a seemingly random direction. Here we go again, I thought. I didn't even attempt to match his pace. I just trailed behind while simulating enthusiasm. The stench of rotting meat assaulted my senses before I perceived the actual carcass. From a distance it just looked like a mound of dirt, but then I noticed the antlers, and then the swarm of flies hovering above it. There, sprawled along a shallow ditch, was the half-eaten body of an adult deer. That's so fucking gross. I stated the obvious through pinched nostrils. The creature's lower half was picked clean, and what scraps still remained were being feasted upon by hordes of wriggling maggots. Flaps of fermented flesh hung from exposed ribs, mired in a sickening miasma of decay. 
think the weird old prune might have been telling truth. I glanced down at Noah, who was squatting next to the dead animal's skull and poking at it with a branch. He gingerly pushed the fur around its neck aside, revealing multiple bite marks. We, of course, weren't exactly qualified to determine whether the culprits had indeed been wolves, but the woman's ramblings didn't seem so far-fetched all of a sudden. Let's just grab our shit and go. I pulled my boyfriend up to his feet and we quickly made our way back to the lodge. Dusk was starting to settle. A peculiar sense of gloom hung in the air. As I pushed the front door open, I was greeted by an unexpected yet familiar visage. Blocking the cramped entryway was none other than Agnes herself. The sightless, scrawny woman stood there like a pale apparition, her form outlined by the dimness of the interior. Lock your damn door, she remarked with a plain tone and retreated further inside, ushering us both to follow. We did, albeit with a substantial degree of uncertainty. Our uninvited guest cautiously maneuvered between the furniture. I heard her joints pop as she found a suitable seat by the cold fireplace. Her hair brushed against the floorboards, her clouded eyes concealed beneath a waterfall of silver tresses. Mustering a modicum of courage, I said, You shouldn't be here. Agnes proceeded to snort in amusement. She tapped her long, spindly fingers against the arm of her chair. Funny was about to say the same thing. As if to emphasize her point, a choir of longing howls suddenly tore through the stillness outside. I felt the tension from before rise from my stomach to my chest, evolving into proper dread. Noah rushed to the nearest window while I just stood there glaring at the hag, who in turn looked utterly aloof. How about it, fellers? Y'all believe the weird old prune now. What do you want? Watch the tone, boy. I'm trying to keep you safe. Keep us safe? Why? From what? From the goddamn wolves! she shouted, rising slightly from her chair with unexpected vigor. Ain't you listening to what I've been telling you? I'm the first. They're here cause of me. And I don't want any more folks dying because of an old grudge. Chill, lady, what the hell are you? All of a sudden there was a thump, closely followed by a rattle. Noah slowly withdrew from the window. His expression was a blend between complete bewilderment and fear. The kind of fear that debilitates you and leaves you unsure whether you're meant to flee or hold your ground. As I peeked over his shoulder, I noticed that the glass was still shaking, as if someone had slapped it before running away. I gently squeezed past my terror-stricken boyfriend, walked up to it and leaned in. Just as I was about to announce that there was nobody out there, a human fist collided with the pane, this time causing it to explode. Shards scattered like shrapnel. Reaching in, the meaty hand wrapped around my throat and pulled me towards the window dragging my entire body through it, before dumping me onto the wooden porch outside. Shattered glass crunched beneath me as I landed. I rolled onto my hands and knees, straining to produce a cough. Noah shrieked in the background. His voice was quickly drowned out by a cacophony of barks and ravenous growls. I had to get to him. I had to. Ignoring the bitter taste of blood in my mouth, I looked up at my assailant. Standing over me was the figure of a man, a large, corpulent man, with arms twice the size of mine and a bloated gut to match. There was a disgusting sheen of filth covering the entirety of his naked body, and consequently suffocating the inflamed sores that occupied its various greasy crevices. The most grotesque feature of them all, however, was undoubtedly the face. His nose was pressed against his skull and his lips were peeled back, revealing blackish gums that had curved, dog-like canines protruding from them. Images of the bite marks around the dead deer's neck flashed briefly before my eyes. The beast man unhinged his oversized jaw and snapped at the air in front of me, drool seeping from between his carnivorous teeth. I wanted to crawl away, but as soon as I reached the edge of the platform, I realized that there was nowhere left to go. Multiple sets of hungry eyes stared back at me. There was an entire pack of those freakish amalgamations surrounding the lodge, each more inhuman than the last. I saw a tall woman whose deformed and disproportionately long limbs allowed her to exclusively walk on all fours. Then there was the man with sharp ears and half his body covered in fur. Behind them both was something that could hardly be categorized as a person, possessing claws and a fleshy, languid appendage that vaguely resembled a tail. I'd compare them to animals, but that would imply a degree of inculpability. They weren't driven by simple instinct. 
There was intent behind their viciousness, and their wretched forms only reflected it. There was a wet snarl in my ear, followed by a sensation of weightlessness, before I was slammed back down against the unforgiving redwood. The air was knocked out of my lungs. I would have cried in agony if I could. The mutant crowd of spectators jumped with sadistic excitement. Some chanted garbled phrases that were impossible to decipher over the ringing in my skull. Others just yapped and howled, encouraging my abuse. Using my elbows, I desperately tried to pull myself forth, only to be picked up for a third and final time. The hulking mass of greasy flesh lifted me above his head, and once again savagely bounced my limp body off the wooden deck. Something audibly snapped. I couldn't tell whether it was a loose board or one of my ribs. Helpless and gasping, I lay there among the broken glass. The world kept fading in and out. Darkness occupied the corners of my waning vision and, in spite of my attempts to stave it off, to remain conscious, it eventually swallowed everything, including me. I was standing beneath Wilhelm Bridge. The trees around me bore shades of autumn, and the air smelled of rain. Across from me, bathed in the shadow of the rocky archway, was a young girl. Her black hair was tied in long braids that had small charms interwoven into them. Her dark, narrow eyes glared at me spitefully. Her lips curled in disdain. I noticed that she kept tugging on the hem of her bright yellow dress, which was dotted with flowery motifs and looked slightly too big for her. She was trying to conceal the bump inside her stomach. Given her age, the implications of a pregnancy were disconcerting to say the least, especially coupled with the clear signs of abuse, like the purple ring of bruises around her neck. She bent over, picked a tiny rock off the ground and threw it at me. It bounced against my chest, landing squarely at my feet. Tears of hatred and frustration rolled down her face. The girl grabbed the fabric around her swollen belly, clenching it in her fist. Suddenly a bitter smile tore through her face. I was stuck in the role of a passive observer, watching through someone else's eyes as dark red bubbles began to appear around corners of her grin. Something was trying to crawl its way out of her. She lurched back, pressed her palms to her stomach, and after what felt like hours of painful retching, a long, bony arm burst forth from her mouth. The ghastly appendage flailed aimlessly before digging its beast-like claws into its host's lower jaw and stretching it past its limit, leaving ample room for another set of fingers to emerge. And then a wolfish skull, and then a torso, and then a leg. My senses were polluted by the familiar stench of rot. I looked down. In place of the pebble that was previously thrown at me was the decaying head of a deer. Its lolled tongue began to twitch. It turned its sunken dead eyes up at me and said, Mark, Marcus, for fuck's sake, please wake up. My eyes shot open. I tried to sit up, but a sharp ache in my ribs forced me to reconsider. I was back on that porch, only now I had Noah kneeling by my side. I heard him breathe a tense sigh, presumably relieved to see me conscious again. He hastily brushed some of the glass off of me, and before I could ask him what was going on, I was already being pulled up to my feet. The pain spread, radiating throughout my upper body, but I did my best to block it out. Though my mind was still rattled, Noah's trembling tone was enough to convey a sense of urgency. Come on, get up. We gotta go. We... what? As I reluctantly guided my eyes away from Noah's pleading expression and towards the clearing, I was greeted by a sight that was as terrifying as it was surreal. Blood flowed freely from recently decapitated torsos, dyeing the grass beneath them crimson. There were limbs and other minced body parts scattered haphazardly about. Guts hung from branches like some sort of twisted Christmas display, with the disembodied shell lying lifeless beneath it, features frozen in a mute scream of agony. A layer of gore was splattered across every conceivable surface, but it was the imposing figure at the center of the hellscape that truly made me question my sanity. It stood as tall as the trees a gangling, bipedal sculpture of muscle and protruding bone. Its skin was stretched so tightly that I could see the individual vertebrae shifting in its back. It was hairless, apart from the pale mane of blood-stained fur dangling from its skull, mercifully obscuring its true visage. Only its lupine muzzle stuck out from between the strands, aligned with rows of jagged, interlocking teeth that couldn't even fit inside its own mouth. The worst part was that, as unfathomably monstrous as it was, 
there was still something about it that I recognized, an underlying tragic element that eluded description. I watched the creature effortlessly pick up one of the lifeless bodies left bleeding on the ground. Its long fingers wrapped around the lesser abomination's dripping remains and lifted them up to its gaping jaws. The crunch that followed finally caused me to avert my eyes. I sought comfort against Noah's chest, pressing my face against it. Can't be real. This can't be real, I whimpered. We have to go, my boyfriend repeated, feigning courage as best he could. He threw my arm over his shoulders and led us away from the lodge. I could feel his rapid breathing on my cheek, his eyes darting wildly in search of the trail back. As evening approached, we pulled out our phones and used them to illuminate the path ahead. A pair of artificial lights, shining in unison, kept the encroaching darkness at bay, if only temporarily. If not for the context, it could have been quite poetic. What the hell happened back there? I finally asked, still wincing. For a while there was no answer, only the rustling of leaves. Agnes, she, she told me to grab you and make a run for it, and that she'll hold those freaks off. Then she just ran out the door and... Fuck me, man, I don't know. Noah shook his head, as if trying to erase or at least suppress that particular memory. When that didn't work, he went on, growing more frantic with each sentence. She started... changing. He phrased it almost like a question, like he didn't fully trust his own recollection. They piled onto her, tried to hold her down, but there was no point. She ripped into them like a fucking chainsaw, and the more she... the more it ate, the more it grew, and... His chin trembled. His attempt at a stoic expression crumbled away, revealing glimpses of the traumatized teenager hiding behind it. God, please tell me you saw that thing too. Please tell me it wasn't all in my head. It's okay, I saw it too. I assured him in the most comforting tone I could muster, though, in truth, a part of me still held out hope that this was all a cruel dream. One by one, stars twinkled into existence. Wilhelm Bridge became a distant silhouette against the dimming sky and soon dipped behind the forest entirely, as if it never existed. The blood loss from my various cuts coupled with the intermittent stabs of pain rendered each step a challenge, but we eventually made our way back to the car. Noah ended up driving me to the nearest walk-in clinic, which thankfully wasn't very far. Turns out that I was right about the broken rib. I was apparently quite lucky that it hadn't punctured a lung. It took half a year, but I eventually made a full recovery, save for a few unsightly scars. When questioned, we opted for a more believable version of the events, explaining that we were attacked by a group of crazy hillbillies out in the woods, which is the same version we later gave to our parents. Lying proved to be the right call, since the local sheriff's department apparently found nothing out of the ordinary when they went up there to survey the scene. No obscene amounts of gore, no half-eaten mutant corpses, no nothing. Though I suspect that it would have been immediately covered up even if they did. Regardless, I won't be planning any trips to Wilhelm Bridge in the foreseeable future. I've mostly kept to my therapist's advice and never really gone down the proverbial rabbit hole. Perhaps digging into the site's history might yield some context to the horrors we experienced that day. But I feel like some things are best left forgotten to time. In fact, Consider this a parting letter to the last 25 years of my life. Noah and I are finally getting married in January, after which we'll be planning a permanent move to Pennsylvania. The cliché thing to do would be to warn you against trying to find the actual landmark I may or may not have renamed to Wilhelm Bridge for the purposes of my story, but we all know how that usually goes. If you do end up finding it, however, do me a favor. If you see an old woman with long white hair and a yellow dress, tell her I said thanks. Someone suggested that I share my weird encounter with this group. I know fiction is allowed, but I assure you that my encounter is not that. I kind of wish it was just so it would be easier to accept, but that isn't the case. My encounter happened in February of 2007. I used to work third shift at a paper stock factory warehouse. The main day shift supervisor was on vacation, so our boss on night shift decided she wanted to leave early so she let us sneak off about two hours earlier than our normal shift end time. So this would have been between 4.30 to 5 a.m. I was following a co-worker down this county road, as the warehouse was on the outskirts of my small rural town. 
I noticed he hit his brakes and proceeded to swerve off the road. I'm probably one thousand behind him, and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is this dude doing? And that's when I saw it. There was a tall, dark shape strolling down the middle of the road, in a hunched over and swaying side to side sort of manner. I have likened it to how one of those tall windblower figures you see swaying at a car dealership or something like that moved. Very unnatural movements. I can't do it justice by describing it as it would only really make sense if someone saw it themselves, I feel like. It looked like a tall person wrapped in a large dark blanket or cloak. I had to hit the brakes and swerve too, but I came to a full stop. Whatever it was, I couldn't make out any features or characteristics. I saw a large torso with two legs. The upper half was hunched forward as if it was leaning like an older person would with a walker. Now at that time I was driving a 1998 Ford Explorer, and I've looked up the height of the vehicle and it lists it as around 67, but whatever walked past my driver's window was a good foot or more higher than that, leaning forward. So I believe whatever was walking was over seven tall minimum. Again I could not see a head, any arms, just a figure with legs walking. My tail lights illuminated it as I started to drive past it. I couldn't make out any definite details for the body. I didn't see fur, skin, or anything like clothing. It was solid, not like a translucent type of thing. It was just large, thick, and black, or at the very least dark gray in color. My co-worker had pulled over into a parking lot a little ways down the road, and I followed him in and you could tell he was scared. He was saying something along the lines of, what was that? It didn't have a head, among a lot of other things most panicked people say. We decided to drive back down and try to see if it's still there and what it actually is. I drove in front and he was following behind. We come up to the general area and I notice there's a large black animal laying in the middle of the road. It appeared to be a big black dog. Part of me knew this wasn't large enough to be what was walking in the road, but we had to stop because it was directly in the middle of the roadway. I decided to get out and walk up to it, all the while my co-worker is yelling at me to get back in my vehicle. As I approach whatever is laying in the road, it brings its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, which I write off as I shine from the headlights, but it growls at me. So I stop dead in my tracks and just watch. This thing stands up on its back legs like a person, but falls back down. It sits back up and hobbles off to the side of the road like a wounded animal that wasn't able to use its front legs. It looked like your typical German Shepherd wolf type face, but its fur was puffy like a chow dog's. It was a lot bigger than most dogs, but still nowhere as tall as whatever was walking down the road. I didn't see any blood or wounds, so I can't say if it was actually hurt or not. My co-worker got out of the car by this point after it had disappeared into the wood line. We discussed what the heck just happened. But while we were talking, I noticed next to our feet was a mouse. It was just standing there with us, but it was cleaning itself. I nudged it with my shoe and it just kept cleaning its face, as if it wasn't afraid of us. The mouse was sitting in the upright position as in it was on its hind legs, and using its front paws to wipe itself. I never really considered it until recently that all three of these bizarre happenings was all on two legs. We got back in vehicles and drove off. And then the next time at work I had mentioned what happened and our co-workers laughed at us. So the other guy who saw it told me if I don't stop talking about it, he's just going to deny it and I best just forget about it. So for essentially fifteen years I never told anyone up until recently. I have tried to rationalize it into something that makes sense, but even then it doesn't completely add up. I have tried to explain it away as it was just a large dog that must have gotten hit by another vehicle before my co-worker and I got there. Maybe it was messing around with the mouse, and it got hit which broke its front legs, so that's why it was trying to use its back legs. The mouse was traumatized from the dog trying to mess with it, so it was just standing there cleaning the dog slobber off itself. That sounds at least plausible until the original thing we saw walking without a head. The dog was nowhere as tall as that thing was. So even with the dog standing upright, it was close to six foot roughly, but whatever was walking had to have been over seven foot tall, as it was so much taller than my explorer even with it hunched forward. I can explain away the dog and mouse, but I can't just explain what that was. So I'm back at square one trying to understand what it could have possibly be. As someone who's always been very skeptical, it becomes very hard to accept the unacceptable. 
I have always been interested in weird creatures and such, but I never truly believed they existed. I still struggle to believe that all these crazy stories could be true, and yet who am I to say they aren't, especially with the weird crap that my former co-worker and I went through that night. All I know is what I saw, but whatever I saw is something I don't know and probably never will. It sounds crazy, and I personally would be hesitant to believe it if someone else told me this happened to them, but that's what happened. <laughs>